gospel that we read from uh, the gospel according to St. Matthew. And in the, the 21st chapter, verse 9, it says, The multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude says, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, out of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. In uh, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who lived around the end of the first century, he wrote a a series of letters, and one of the letters he wrote to the church of Smyrna, he says, wherever the bishop shall appear, there let the multitude of the people also be, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the universal or the Catholic church. And this morning as we, we began the liturgy, as we began, the kind of, we opened with the procession, and as we read the gospel, we chanted a hymn called the Flogi Menos, right? And this is a hymn that we we really only chanted on Palm Sunday, and then one other time, which is when the Pope enters the church. The whole idea is that Christ, of course, he's the high priest entering into Jerusalem. Okay, The Pope is simply an icon of the high priest. But the high priest is entering Jerusalem, and we see after he comes in, he heals people in the temple. People are saying, Hosanna to him. He finds the temple as a place where it was no longer a house of prayer. And of course, he flips the table is upside down, all right? He, he goes ballistic on the people and kind of like starts getting rid of the people from inside the temple because they weren't using the temple or the church as a place of worship, but rather they were using it for other reasons, okay? They were using it to buy and sell and to benefit themselves. The gospel reading from John chapter 12 was the passage we just read from, from uh, for the Hosanna Sunday. But I want to start, I want to kind of give you a little bit of backdrop as to the passages that we just read. Because I think when we read Scripture, what we're going to find <clears throat> is that Scripture is it's, it's within a context of something greater, right? We can't, I, like, we can't just read a certain passage outside of a context of something, something bigger, okay? So this morning's passage, specifically from John, we'll look at Matthew and Mark, um, possibly Luke if there's time. The Gospel of John... Chapter 11, we read yesterday, okay? Yesterday we celebrated a day called Lazarus Saturday. We said last Sunday, we said that the whole idea of Lazarus Saturday is that it's, it's letting us know, like, when Jesus says, I'm the resurrection, I am the resurrection of the life, basically the whole idea is that Pascha week is starting projecting for us that this morning Saturday is a prophecy for next Saturday of what we're going to be celebrating, Okay? That the whole week, the whole Pascha, is not just about Thursday, Friday, but it culminates at Saturday, which is the Feast of Pascha. So that was yesterday's readings. And then a passage we don't read is John chapter 12, where it says that Mary anoints the feet of Jesus. She comes in, or he comes into the, her house, or a house, and Mary, the sister of Lazarus, is there. And a bunch of people are present because Jesus just raised Lazarus from the dead. And so folks are walking in, they want to see, like, what's going on. Like, they want to see Lazarus, and they want to see this Jesus who raised Lazarus. And then Mary, his sis, Lazarus' sister, comes and she pours out, like, super expensive oil. You could say, like, thousands of dollars in our modern time worth of oil on his feet, and she starts wiping them with his head. Of course, some of the disciples, they get frustrated, they get angry. They're like, what are you doing? It's a waste of money. And he says, listen, this is for my burial, Okay. This is the priest coming in, preparing himself to offer himself as a living sacrifice on behalf of humanity. And of course, the passage we just read, the Hosanna passage, which means, Hosanna means save us. Okay? Hosanna, it's a word that means save us. So the people, as Jesus is coming in, they're saying save us. Of course, from in their minds, they're saying save us from Roman bondage. But we're saying to Jesus Christ, save us from bondage of slavery to sin and to death. Okay? So just a little bit of background. The Gospel of Matthew that, that I just read to you from, 
the chapter right before gives us an idea of what it was that Christ was coming to accomplish as he enters Jerusalem. Okay? Jesus Christ enters Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Some people thought he was coming in as a military leader. But he comes in as the king of peace riding on a colt, as a donkey. Okay? He comes in, and what I'd like to suggest to you is that as he comes in, he comes to give up his life. Okay? Christ doesn't come to free the people from Roman bondage. He comes to free all of humanity from the bondage of slavery and death, of slavery to sin and death. And he does so by offering up his life. He does this, and I come back to this word, he does this as, as the high priest, who John Chrysostom tells us that he's the high priest, he's the altar, and he's the sacrifice all at the same time. Okay? So Christ comes in to offer himself up so that we would have life. And what I'd like to tell you is that he does this for us, but he also does this through us. Okay? He does this first, or did this first for us, but he continues to do this through us, his church. He continues to offer up his life, coming in victory into the world, through his people, through his church, through his body, so that as he offers up his life through us, others would receive his life. Okay? I want to give you three ways that he does this in the chapters that come right before the Palm Sunday passages that we just read. Okay? So, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 26. Okay, we read from Matthew 21, that's the Palm Sunday passage. The chapter that comes right before it, chapter 20, Jesus tells the disciples, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to give himself, and, but to serve and to give him his life as a ransom for me. Okay? So Jesus is telling us greatness is something to be desired. Okay? He says that if you desire greatness, this is how you accomplish it. Okay? What I'd like to give you this morning is three simple points that have to go along with this idea of Christ, our high priest, coming to give us life. Okay? And how we, as his body, continue his ministry of reconciliation, as Paul the Apostle says, by living out his life, bringing victory to the world. Number one, he says that giving up our lives is a, he says, is greatness, okay? He says, whoever desires to be great, whoever desires to be great, and who here among us doesn't desire to be great, okay? Not a single person who is sitting here who doesn't desire to be great at something, okay? Whether it's your job, or it's, it's your married life, or it's your parenting, or it's your child, or it's softball, or it's soccer, whatever it is that you want to be great at. Or as a child of God, we all want to be great at something. And what I want to tell you is that Christ is telling us that we're created for greatness. And that we should strive for greatness. Okay? It says, whoever desires to be great should do, and we'll talk about the should do in a second. Okay? But greatness is something that we can only learn being great by following the one who's great. Jesus Christ is the great high priest. Okay? He is, he is the definition of greatness. And I want to tell you something else because I think in, our, in, in, in the Orthodox Church, folks have said to me like, like, you know, sometimes we look at the priesthood and we like give a great deal of honor to the priesthood. Okay? And I want to tell you absolutely you do. And the reason being is because Jesus Christ is the high priest. Okay? And that's one of his great titles that we give him is he is the high priest. When we talk about Pope Tuadros, he's, he's an icon of the high priest. Same with the bishop, okay? That's why when St. Ignatius says, wherever the bishop is, there's the people. Just as where Christ is, there's the universal church. He's saying that the bishop, the priest, serves as an icon. It's not the real thing. He's an icon for the one who's the high priest, okay? The one who's great is Christ. Let me tell you something better than that. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, 
Peter tells the church that you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Okay? So yeah, I want to tell you priesthood, not just the ordained priesthood, the, the priesthood of which all Christians are called to be is greatness. And I'm going to tell you why in just a minute. Right? That is a great thing to be able to stand as a royal priest before God. And what I want to tell you is each and every one of us, body, everyone in the, in the, the, the Laos or the people of God, this is what we were created to be. Before the fall, we were created to be kings, prophets, and priests. So I want to tell you every single one of you is created to be part of the royal priesthood. Each and every one of us is, is created to offer up and to give thanks before God, to give prayers to God to serve God, and to serve one another. So number one, you were created for greatness, and part of that greatness comes as we see the high priest Jesus Christ himself entering into Jerusalem. The people are saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us, save us, save us. And then he enters into the temple and says, listen, my house, my father's house, this has got to be a house of prayer. Okay? And so when we come and we stand before God, we're standing before God to offer up prayers. We're not coming to God to seek stuff. And this was the problem that Jesus dealt with in the temple that day. He said, you're coming to, to the, the, the temple, you're coming to God to get stuff, not to give stuff. Okay? So number one, you were, you were created, I want to tell you, for greatness. And we see this in the person of Jesus Christ. St. Athanasius tells us that God became man so that we as people would become like God. We say God is great, right? Like, well, that's one of the things that if you want to say, like, God is good, no, no, God isn't good, God is great. God is beyond great. So what I want to tell you is that God came so that we, His image, His great image would be restored in each and every one of us, every single last one of us. Part of the way that greatness comes, though, is what we got to talk about next, okay? So greatness, yes, every one of us is paid for greatness. Every one of us strives for greatness. But how do we accomplish greatness? How do we reach greatness? And this is exactly what Christ offers to us this morning. He says, whoever desires to become great among you, let him what? Let him become your servant. Whoever desires to be great, let him be your servant. In one of the passages it says, if you want to become great, become a slave for everyone. In other words, for us to become great, we follow the model of the king, the triumphant king, riding in on the colt, on the donkey. People are saying, Hosanna to him. He comes in not to rule the people. He comes in to serve the people. And this is what Christ, his whole ministry was about. And when he came in, so beautiful, kind of, <laughs> the gospel according to St. Matthew, passage you just read says that he came in and the word that it uses to describe the servant, he says he was doing wonderful things. Like, think about that. Jesus was doing wonderful things. He was healing people. He was healing people. He was serving the people. Even on his victory parade, he's serving the people. And the children began to say, Hosanna to him. He's doing wonderful things. And then the Pharisees back to their old games, they're like becoming indignant. They're angry. They're frustrated. They're like, what's he doing? He's serving the people. He's helping the people. He's healing the people. And they're saying, well, son to him. What they understood was that this great servant came to save them. Yesterday, I was talking with a few folks, talking about how we as a society have become a consumerist society. Okay? We were chatting yesterday about how in the next five years, you and I will order something off of Amazon, and within a couple of hours, a drone will deliver it to our, to our house. Okay? It's fantastic. Okay? It's great. Problem is, we become like, especially here in the West, we become all about consuming, about getting stuff. And what Christ is offering to us is that greatness comes not by consuming, but comes by serving, comes by giving. This was the whole ministry of Jesus Christ. Even when he rides in 
on his victory parade, he comes to offer, to serve. We find he went to the well. He went to the well to serve this woman. He went to the well to serve humanity. We find in a few days on Thursday, he's going to be washing feet. He comes riding in on a donkey to Jerusalem to serve the people. He went to the cross. He went to the tomb. Even in the tomb, he goes down into, into Hades to bring the people out. Christ, the whole like, life of Christ, if you want to like, give a very simple word, he came to serve the people. And this is what he says in Mark 10, 45. Son of man came not to be served, but to serve. Okay? This, is, this is the image. I want to tell you this is the true image of the priesthood. Sometimes, I want to tell you, like we've confused the idea of priesthood. The priest is there to be served. <clears throat> the priest is there to serve the people. Okay? The ordained priesthood and the general priesthood. Okay? That's why we serve one another. That's why we as the, the, the royal priesthood, all of his people, he calls us to serve the world, to serve the people, serve creation. In Tisbeh, we do something real funny. We start saying, the rocks praise you, and the mountains praise you, and, and the oceans praise you, and the streams praise you, and the fish praise you, and anything that can't speak praises you. Why? What are we doing? We're serving on behalf of them as their tongue. We become priests for the rest of all creation. And this is especially important, I want to tell you, in the ecological crisis that the church is in, or the world is in today. We have become a consumer society. And what Christ is showing us here as he rides into Jerusalem, he says, You're, you want to know what greatness is? Greatness isn't about consuming. Greatness is about giving. It's about serving. It's about offering. There's no place and no thing that Jesus wouldn't have done in order to save humanity. And that is why St. Athanasius is writing on the Incarnation. He tells us, that it would have been absolutely absurd for Christ to not come and save us. It would have been absurd. That's the exact word he uses. He says, it would have been absurd for us to, him to see us and say, ah, like, I know their need. Let them perish. Absurd. Greatness is defined in Jesus Christ coming in, into Jerusalem. People are saying, Hosanna to him. You're the king. You're here to save us. And he's coming and healing people. He's opening the eyes of the blind and the lame. He's, he's serving the folks, even when the people are coming, saying, you're our king, you're here to save us. He says, let me show you what greatness is. Let me show you what priesthood, the royal priesthood is all about. It's here for me to give, not to receive. And the final point We've got greatness, we've got serving. The last point is the exchange. Mark 10, 45 tells us, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This word ransom, the Greek word is litron, okay? And this word litron doesn't, like, the word ransom actually doesn't capture the whole idea. Ransom gives you an image that, like, somehow, like, humanity was being held by Satan or by someone and Jesus had to pay something to the, to the Father, to the devil, or to someone. The idea of litron, though, doesn't give this idea of like a, a ransom payment. The idea of litron is that there was an exchange that was made. Okay? The exchange was this, that God came, he took what was ours, he took our humanity, and he says, I'm going to give you an unfair, unequal exchange. Okay? You give me your humanity, I'm going to let you share in my life. I'm going to give you to be a partaker of my divine nature. That's exactly what St. Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says that we have been given to become partakers of the divine nature. The exchange, totally unfair and unequal. We for sure got the better end of the deal. Okay? That's like you come and you give your kids... You give your kids, like, whatever they ask you to give them. And they'll say, I'll do anything for you. And you're like, all I want from you is a hug. That's it. But I'll give you anything. That's all you can give me. Okay? I want to tell you that the exchange is completely unequal. It's unprecedented. 
The word comes and says, give me what's yours. Give me what's yours. This is what our high priest does. He comes and says, give me what's yours. And I'm going to give you what's mine. The beauty about this, though, what I want to tell you, is that we can't give of ourselves to other people. We can't. St. Athanasius, in the same work on the Incarnation, he says, if we return to our original state, we'd return to nothingness. If we return back to what we were originally, we'd return to nothing. And that's why Christ came in the flesh. The beauty is this, though. When we, as much as like we feel like greatness is something God has created us for, and we know that greatness comes from serving, and those of you who have, have given of yourselves to serve others, you know that there's no other time you feel like that you know that you are doing what you are supposed to be doing than when you're giving of yourselves to serve other people. But the beauty about this last part is the exchange is not we take what's theirs and give us what's us. You know, if we gave them what was ours, we give them nothing. So the beauty is this. We don't give them us. We give them Christ. Okay? People don't need us. I want to tell you, a world that's hurting out there, a world that's like dying, a world that's in pain, they don't need us. They don't need military freedom. They don't need freedom from whatever we might think it is. The people thought when Jesus was coming in, they were saying, Hosanna to you, save us, save us. He was saying, you're saying save us from military bondage. I'm telling you I'm here to save you from that. I'm here to free you from your sin. I'm here to liberate you. It's for that reason that the apostles, Peter and John, when they went into the temple, the book of Acts, and they saw a man who was begging. They said, silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give you in the name of Jesus. Take up your bed and walk. The exchange is this, that when we come into the church, that we become chrismated, we receive the holy charis, the, the, the chrism, and as a result, we give up things. We give echristeo, we give up the Eucharist. Okay? He gives us what's his, and all we can give him back is thanks. And the beauty is that when we go and we look to serve and to offer others as Christ offered us, we're saying, Lord, I can't give anything of my own. All I can give is of what's yours. All I can give to anyone else is Christ. Let me close with this final thought for you. I've shared this with a number of you before, but years ago when we went to serve in, in a mission in Africa, Ambabulis insisted that if you don't spend time sitting with God in the morning in prayer and receiving from Him, He says, don't waste your time to go out and talk to the people. He says, you're like, and He would always like, like slam us. He goes, you Americans, you come here to be great and to serve the people and to save them. You're nothing, you're foolish, okay? This was like Emma Bullis, like typical Emma Bullis. And what he told us, at the, like, which really got through to us, he says, they need nothing from you. These people need Jesus Christ. If you sit with God and you allow Him to fill you with Him, then you have something to give to the people when you go out. Otherwise, you go out, you give people yourself, they're going to end up dead again. Because, like, forgive me, but like, as great as we are, people don't need us. Great quotes, okay? As great as we may be, they need Christ. Okay? The beauty is that God can take death and transform it to life. Ezekiel 37 shows us just that. I want to leave you with an image as we stand to pray. The prophet Ezekiel is out in the middle of this field, and God tells him, the boats sinews, all these things, dead. But I want to give life. And that's the reason as we stand and pray, as you cannot get this idea of Hosanna out of your head, I want you to stand and say, God, give me life. Save me. Save me from death. I, give you my, I come to give you my life so that you would give me your life. I come to give you my life so that you would fill me with you, who you are. As we stand to pray, I want to really invite you. Hosanna, save us, God.
Save us. Save me from where I'm at. Save me from, from my present condition. Save me from sin. Save me from death. Save me from whatever I'm in. You and I are known, we can do nothing. I promise you. If we don't seek the grace of God to work at us, we can do nothing. I'm telling you from my own experience, when I try my labor to be like to save myself, nothing. I continue to my sin, continue to my death. It's only Jesus Christ, His grace that fills us, that can, can, can save us from what we're in and where we're at. Pray that that would be what we experience today as we continue and let Him fill us with His presence. All glory be to His God.